Welcome to another edition of CHP Talks, listeners and viewers. We are live today with a very special guest, Dr. John Robson, and we're going to be talking about Canada's Constitution, the Magna Carta, uh, points of history, the, the uh, right to self-defense, freedom of speech, many topics that we're planning to cover today, and we are so glad to have our special guest, John Robson, with us. Yes, uh, good morning, John. It's uh, great to have you here. And for those who don't know, uh, John Robson is the Executive Director of the Climate Discussion Nexus. Uh, he's a documentary filmmaker, a columnist with the National Post, a professor at Augustine College, and he holds a PhD in American history from the University of Texas at Austin. And I'll throw in also that uh, he was a much appreciated speaker at our 2017 uh, National Convention in Ottawa. And so, John, it's a great uh, pleasure to have you here with us today and an honor to, to uh, hear from you today. Well, it's good to be with you digitally, but we're still here. Yeah. yeah. So you, you've, uh, in your documentary history, you've, you've made a documentary about the Magna Carta, and um, maybe we need to just introduce that to some of the audience who might not be familiar with it, and then um, also how that relates to Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Would you start us off with some uh, background? The Magna Carta is fundamental to our system of government, and we made the documentary in part because it was the 800th anniversary of the king being obliged to place his seal upon it, as you may imagine. The king wasn't very keen on limitations on his power to tax and spend and imprison without trial and other such uh, instruments. Uh, but one of the things about Magna Carta that was very striking and became clearer and clearer as we did the research is that Magna Carta in 1215 was not a revolution in government in England. It was not a group of people who'd gotten together and said, you know, this is how we should be governed. Let's change it. On the contrary, the people who were critical to Magna Carta, thought that this is how the English had been governed, time out of mind, for hundreds of years, and they were concerned that King John was an innovator who was undermining their long-standing institutions of liberty. And in fact, one of the things that I wasn't even aware of about Magna Carta until I again began to do the detailed research was that it originated with the Archbishop of Canterbury. Stephen Langton, who, you know, in his day job was a cleric who divided the Bible into the uh, chapters that we still use. So he was, he was busy with other things too, but he was very concerned about King John and with good reason. And so in uh, 1213, he'd summoned a gathering of uh, barons and senior clerics and said, here's the coronation oath of John's great-grandfather, King Henry I, promising to respect our freedoms. We need to force John to reissue this. And because he's such a snaky character, we need to add some things to it. And this is the origin of the document that became Magna Carta that restates the rights of the English and says that the king cannot take them away. And this is part of a long argument over whether the king makes the law or the law makes the king. And this echoes down through the centuries. P repeatedly, governments try to say the law is in our mouth, as Richard II phrased it, that what we say is law. And time and again, they were told, no, the people actually must consent to the way that they are governed. We think of this again, we may think of the American Revolution as a kind of innovation where they said, we the people will pass a constitution. But the people who made the American Revolution didn't think of themselves as innovators any more than Stephen Langton and his colleagues had. They thought that the king was trying to take away their traditional system of free government and they were not going to allow him to do it. And therefore, when they created a, a constitutional document that stood above the legislature and the executive branch, they were not creating a new kind of government. They were looking back to Magna Carta. And we actually made, we made a constitutional trilogy. We made the Magna Carta documentary, and then we made one about fixing our constitution, and then one on the right to bear arms. And we went down to Boston, and there's a copy of the Massachusetts Seal from 1775, and it shows a patriot looking like the old New England Patriot uh, football team logo, but he's got a sword in one hand, and in the other he's got a scroll, and you can clearly read the words Magna Charta on it. So 
that was the American understanding, but it was also the Canadian understanding. Again, people think, well, the Americans invented liberty. Well, no, obviously they didn't. They were deliberately enforcing the rights of Englishmen. And so were the people who made Canada. You look at our founding debates, and there's a big argument over confederation between people saying, preserve your English liberty, confederate, and people saying, preserve your English liberty, don't confederate. But there's nobody saying liberty is a foreign value to Canadians. Right. Uh, and so it's important to understand that we are free, that we have things like freedom of speech and such property rights as we have, and the right to veto the actions of our government because for hundreds of years, people didn't let Magna Carta slip away. And that is both an inspiration and something of an obligation. We can't be the ones to say, oh, phooey, it's written on vellum. Never mind that. <laughs> well said. So in terms of the, the Charter of Rights, obviously, you know, the Magna Carta is going back hundreds and hundreds of years. The, the Charter is within many of our lifetimes. Um, how does that help or hinder the pursuit of individual freedoms and liberties? I'm sorry to have to say this, but our Charter of Rights and Freedoms is a botched job. Right? Our, our philosopher King was uh, neither King nor philosopher. And one of the funny things about Pierre Trudeau is that he believed he was a civil libertarian, but he created a constitution that empowered government. He, he totally mangled it. And the big problem with our Charter of Rights and Freedoms isn't the notwithstanding clause. So that I think is, is a fairly offensive and jury rigged uh, rather than principled piece of work. It's not even the rights that were left out, although polls showed at the time that over 80% of Canadians wanted property rights included, but governments didn't, so they left it out. The, the two huge problems are section one, which says that these rights are guaranteed uh, and may be infringed only to the extent that it is justified in a free and democratic society without really spelling out how that's going to be decided. So, of course, it comes to the judges that the politicians appoint. And you see this time and again, when someone goes to court and says, my charter rights have been violated, my right to free speech or some other right. And the justices will first look and say, was it violated? And they'll say, yes, it was. And then they'll say, is it justified in a free and democratic society? And they go, yeah, we think that's for the greater good of the greater number. Uh, the court plays social engineer and section one lets them. But the other thing that's wrong with our charter and with our whole constitution is that it isn't founded in popular consent. In 1867, confederation was debated by legislatures that had been elected in most of what became the first early Canada by voters who understood that confederation was the issue. And there wasn't even a discussion. Can a legislature make a constitution in a parliamentary system? And some people said, no, we need a referendum. Other people said the legislature can do everything. But the view that prevailed by and large, according to Janet Eisenstadt, who's written an excellent book on Locke and our founding, was that provided the legislature was elected by people who knew that the job of this legislature was to say yay or nay to confederation, it embodied popular consent. The Americans, of course, did it state by state with ratifying uh, conventions and votes. But the 82 Constitution, and one of my fun questions for people is, how did the 1982 Constitution become law? <laughs> it's not an act of the Canadian Parliament, because the Canadian Parliament didn't have the authority to enact it. And if they had enacted it, they could change it. You could, you could just modify it by law. It's not an act of the British Parliament either, because the British Parliament cannot amend our Constitution. When we try to amend it, and the amending formula is a complete hoorah's nest, uh, but we don't go to Westminster and say, oh, please, would you do this? So how did it become law? And nobody knows. You know, people say, oh, it's the most wonderful thing in the world. How did it become law? Well, the answer is by let letters patent from the Queen. And I wouldn't mind if that was how it was done formally, if there'd been a referendum but there never was. I mean, the British Parliament was asked to pass their enabling legislation by uh, a parliament in which Pierre Trudeau had a majority only because he held 74 of 75 Quebec seats, which would be bad enough if it weren't also the case that Quebec is a province where that constitution has been has never been accepted by a majority of the populace or the political class. So the constitution was was essentially created by a legislature after a bunch of backroom dealing whose members did not have popular consent to make this constitution. And so when I w did my draft constitution, which you can find on my website, you go into documentaries and choose strong and free and then there's a copy of it. I say we have to have a referendum and those jurisdictions that approve it 
become part of the new Canada and those that don't stay out. Uh, and they'll be welcome later. There's a, there's a way for people to join and so on. But uh, really going back to Magna Carta, it's always been understood that the consent of the people stood above statute law. And again, you, you look at Magna Carta in 1215 and then down through the years, it's repeatedly stated and enacted by Parliament that any statute contrary to Magna Carta is null and void. But that ceased to be true. Sometime in the 18th century, they kind of went, oh, that's just too inconvenient. And they, it gradually slipped away in Britain, which is partly why the American uh, revolutionaries said, hey, we got, we got to tie this down really firmly because they will pry it loose if we let them. But in Canada, the idea of popular consent just seemed to disappear. And it's so strange in Trudeau, who is all into people power. But if he said, well, would you like to empower the people? He's like, oh, heck no. What? I'm not, I'm not even sure he would have known how. Uh, Trudeau is an incompetent sorcerer's apprentice um, and produced a constitution that did not do any number of things that he expected it to and wanted it to. And we somehow got stuck with it and we can't change it. Their amending formula is about 1,100 words long and it has provisions that conflict and nobody really understands it. And so it wasn't the 57 provinces, 50% of the populace, but that's only for some things. You know, the American Constitution had a very short amending formula, and part of it, deplorably, was attempting to prevent them from abolishing slavery, at least for 20 years. Um, and that part's lapsed. So their amending formula is, I think, 140 words, roughly. Um, you know, ours is 1,100. They can do it, and we can't. This thing is a terrible mess. And it's, it's not grounded in popular consent. It doesn't secure popular liberty. It doesn't guarantee us good government. Uh, it does very little that you'd want a constitution to do. And then in typical Canadian fashion, we're told, yeah, well, it stinks, but there's nothing you can do. So, and I think Canada's better than that. You know, I think, yes, we can't is a terrible national slogan. <laughs> <laughs> well said. So... How, where does the uh, Canadian Bill of Rights fit into all this? There is still uh, on the books a uh, Canadian Bill of Rights that does include property rights. It's only an act of the legislature. Uh, in other words, it's not doesn't have the same uh, depth or, uh, uh, I guess, uh, solemnity as the Constitution. But, but uh, how do you see that fitting in? Unfortunately, it really doesn't, because they're, they're one of the fundamental rules of a parliamentary system is that no parliament can bind its successor. And that means that if there's a law and then another law is passed that conflicts with the first law, the later law just overrides the earlier one. Um, and, and that's, that's so any, any law that violates the Bill of Rights uh, simply prevails in a conflict. The, uh, the Bill of Rights does not have uh, super uh, legal or super legal status. It's just another piece of legislation. States and aspirations was enforceable unless and until, but it really had no binding power. And this is where, I mean, the American Constitution says that the Congress, the legislature, cannot do certain things, just can't do them. And the executive cannot do certain things. And the only way to change that, other than to get judges to start getting clever, which of course the Americans have had a problem with as well, is to go to the people and say, well, what do you think about this? And I mean, the Americans have done this on a number of occasions. Like, hey, we don't let women vote. Should we let women vote? Well, the American way of settling that was to go to the people who could vote and say, what do you think about that? And you know, they look at their wives and then they said, yeah, I'm, I'm in favor. I think we should let women vote. Uh, <laughs> That with Americans at one point banned alcohol, and then they went back to the people and said, "Was that the dumbest thing we ever did?" And people said, "Yeah, pretty much it was." And then they they unbanned it, you know. Uh, but in Canada, we we are, have not been in the habit of doing these things. Although, if you take our history as our long history, going back to Britain, going back to England, going back into Saxon England, and if, again, if people watch the uh, Magna Carta documentary, we had a talk with Daniel Hannon, who's an expert on that and many other things. And he talked about the extraordinary degree to which there was liberty under law prior to the Norman conquest, that even the mightiest in the land had to go to court to get a few horses back from someone who wasn't paying the rent they were meant to on them. Um, so in a, in a very real way, our constitutional history is founded on popular consent, because for many centuries, Magna Carta set limits on what the king and parliament could do, even if all the politicians ganged up, if they did something that was contrary to Magna Carta, uh, they would be prevented from doing it. And so just because we haven't had that recently doesn't mean that it's un-Canadian. What's un-Canadian is the, is the more recent system in which we have uh, become playthings of the state 
you know, and, and as I say in the documentary, for a long time, Canada was a country where the state could be small because the people were big. And it's not good for a civilization, a culture, or for individuals to be reduced to dependency. Uh, governments that are asked to do things they cannot do will fail even to do the things they can and should do. And again, it's so curious, the debates in Canada where you say, well, maybe we should just have the government not do this. And people look at you aghast, well, then it wouldn't happen. It's like, oh, for goodness sakes, of course it would happen. We'd make it happen. We would form voluntary associations. We would do it through charity. We would do it through all kinds of innovative methods. We've always been good at that kind of thing. And again, when I say we, I don't just mean, you know, the biological descendants of people who were at Runnymede or, you know, maybe fought King Charles I or fought for him for that matter. I mean, anyone who becomes Canadian, one of the things I would love to do it when people become Canadian citizens, they take the oath and everything. I would then like to hand them a Magna Carta and say, congratulations, it's yours now. This is one of the most precious inheritances in the world. And by your judgment and determination in becoming Canadian, you have now become a part of this great story of securing liberty under law. You, you are now an inheritor of Vimy Ridge. You are now an inheritor of Waterloo. You are an inheritor of the glorious revolution. And there are other stories I tell in the Magna Carta documentary as well. The most dangerous moment probably for liberty in the English-speaking world was actually under Henry VIII. You know, one of my rules of history is never marry Henry VIII. But uh, <laughs> he's, he's not just a, a mortal hazard as a husband. He was a very dangerous Renaissance would-be absolute monarch. And at one point, and he would threaten to behead MPs if they didn't pass his bills. And, and, and he wasn't joking. But... At one point, he told Parliament they had to pass a bill saying his word was law, that any decree of the king was a, was a legal statute. And Parliament sort of looked at him with their knees knocking. They said, well, okay, but it doesn't include anything that touches our ancient rights, liberties, privileges, or any laudable custom of the realm. And so they said, hey, now you see it, Henry, now you don't. And, and this was a, a tremendous moment. And there's another, there's another moment where during the English Civil War, King Charles I actually led a band of armed men into the parliament. And he was looking for five MPs who were leaders of the, of the resistance. And he looked around and they were gone. And he actually had the speaker dragged out of his chair and the king sat in the speaker's chair. And then he said to the speaker, who was right, widely regarded as a spineless hack, his name was William Lenthal, he said, where are those five MPs? And somehow or other, Lenthal, at the critical moment in his whole public life, found the courage to respond, if it please your majesty, I have neither eyes to see nor mouth to speak in this place, except as the house directs me whose servant I am. And this is why to this day, when the throne speech is to be delivered, they come down and knock on the door of parliament and it's slammed in their face in memory of the defiance of King Charles I. And again, this is a wonder, you think how badly so many parts of the world are governed. And if you're rummaging through your heritage in so many places and trying to find something on which to build an understanding that we are a free people, and that we all have rights and that the inalienable dignity of every human being must be respected, it's slim pickings. But if you're a Canadian by birth or by naturalization, you have this amazing story of all these great moments. Another of the heroes that I, I discovered, partly because a reader sent me a note saying, oh, have you heard of Edward Cook? And I was embarrassed and said, no, I haven't. And they said, I'll send you a biography. But he was, a, again, a leader of the opposition to the Stuarts, to James I and then Charles I. And he, was, um, he had all kinds of jobs. He was attorney general. He was speaker of the house. He was, uh, and then he, he was kicked upstairs to be head of the civil and then the criminal court by James the first. And there were ecclesiastical courts that the king controlled, and he kept trying to move cases over so that he could have his way. And Cook kept issuing these writs saying, you can't do that if there's any non-theological aspect to this matter. And finally, he was summoned before the king and berated for it. And they had an argument. And uh, James said, you know, as uh, the king, I will always protect the law. And Cook said, no, the law protects the king. And James had a fit and accused him of treason. And there was much groveling and begging. And people had to throw themselves literally on their faces and say, don't kill him. And finally, James said, fine, OK, I won't kill you today. And he went off. And Cook went back. And the next day, he issued another one of those writs saying, you can't take over a case. And that this is an amazing story of people who, under very dangerous and difficult circumstances, where it would have been so easy to bend and give in, 
stood their ground at risk of their lives. And again, what, what a thing to have as your heritage. Then what a thing to say, eh, that old thing, I'm not interested in that. We, we really need to keep these stories alive. And as I say, I'd written a column about liberty, and that's so a reader said, have you heard of Edward Cook? And I hadn't. So the, then he sent me this biography, The Lion and the Throne. And there's a lot of Cook in the Magna Carta documentary, but it only happened because somebody enlightened me in my profound and embarrassing ignorance. I'd never heard of this man. I have a PhD in history. Um, you know, spent 10 years at university, it feels like, and, and no one had ever said the name of Edward Cook to me. So I don't blame people for not knowing, but let's, let's go watch those documentaries. And this is, you know, I should have passed the hat, but I've got it the wrong way up because the documentaries were crowdfunded. They're all on my website and on YouTube, and you don't have to pay to watch them. You can send me money, of course. I can, I can fit it into the hat. But uh, thanks to the people who crowdfunded it, it's all there for people to watch and realize that they're part of a great adventure tale. You know, you think, oh, modern times are dull. All the great excitement is gone. World War II was the last good war. Uh, no, it's, uh, believe me, the, the story of liberty is an ongoing story. And if you think it's hopeless now, it sure looked bad a lot of times before. That's also, I sometimes look at World War II and think, man, you know, 1940, you think, okay, well, that's the end of that. Um, even Churchill was afraid maybe it is too late. And, and yet the free societies, because they were free societies, were able to summon the resources, find the ingenuity, win against long odds, and keep liberty alive. And it would sure be uh, embarrassing if we then, you know, we sort of let the torch drop into a puddle in the midst of what by some important standards are much less serious problems than say when the Armada is bearing down on England. And this is Francis Drake has told the Armada's coming and he says, well, I'll finish my bowling game. They're not moving that fast. Uh, you know, um, so there, I mean, there's so many great stories and, and implausible ones and, uh, there are heroes in this story, there are villains, um, but there is a great deal to inspire you. Um, and there's even a, there's a story of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson going to visit the site of the last battle in the English Civil War and uh, finding that the locals weren't very interested in the place and lecturing them and telling them it was sacred ground and so on. And then, and apparently the, the reception they got was, oh gee, I, maybe we, we ought to think a little more about that. And eventually they put up a memorial and there's a plaque and things of that sort. Uh, but, but it is really, there's a line in, uh, in Prince Caspian where they talk about the history that was taught under the usurper of Miraz as being duller than the uh, truest history and less true than the wildest adventure story. And the strange thing about the story of Magna Carta and of the survival of liberty under law over well over a thousand years, uh, is that it is ex exciting as the Lord of the Rings and as true as the history that bored you to death in high school. Even going back to Alfred the Great, another of my heroes from uh, Canadian history, who is the king of England in the darkest part of the Dark Ages, when the Saxons had come over, destroyed Roman Britain as, as you know, wielding fire and sword and worshiping terrible pagan gods. And then they were converted. I mean, even this, this is a ridiculous story, right? Where a bunch of guys with shaved heads came ashore and said, would you like to stop the feasting and massacring and hear about how a dead Jewish carpenter was God? And, and the Saxons go, okay, well, why don't you tell us about that? And the, the monks tell them about it. And the Saxons go, wow, our religion's really dumb. Okay, we'll become Christian. And they start making law codes. And then lo and behold, more terrible pagan invaders come across the sea in the, all these Danish invasions. And Alfred, at one point, he's um, ambushed, he's almost killed, he flees into the marshes of Athelney. And this is where we get a story that apparently is not true. But Alfred goes to this peasant's hut in disguise and says, I'm a poor wanderer, can I come in and warm myself by the fire? And the woman looks at him like, well, I don't know about you, you look pretty suspicious, bud, but it's Christian duty, okay, come on in. And I'm going to go out and glean, just watch the little loaves that are baking, the cakes, and don't let them burn. So Alfred is trying to figure out how he's going to rally his men and if mercy is still on board and next thing he knows the hut's full of smoke and the woman's in the doorway saying wow you're no good vagabond you lay about your bum all i said was watch the cakes and now what have you done but the punchline of the story is that alfred didn't stand up and say on your knees madam i am the king or swatter with his sword or some such act he apologized 
And I said, that story probably didn't happen. But then he did rally his men. He beat the Danes. He forced them to convert to Christianity. He rebuilt the Navy. And then as an adult, he taught himself Latin so he could translate books into Anglo-Saxon because learning in the kingdom had fallen into disrepair. And that's all true. And the story of the cakes was told for a thousand years at people's dinner tables to, so we would understand what kingship meant in the English-speaking world. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't know if I'm running out the clock, but the other one's King Canute. Everybody knows that Canute thought he could stop the tides. Yuck, 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 what a loser, right? And people will still say, oh, he's like Canute. But that's not the story of Canute at all. He's actually a Danish interloper, but a good king. And he was being flattered by his courtiers. You're so wonderful. You're so beloved of God. You're the best. You could even command the waves. And so Canute said, gee, well, I believe in evidence-based decision-making. Let's see if that's really true. Take my chair down to the shore at low tide. And they did, and he sat in it, and the seawater started rising, and he said, I am Canute. I command you to halt. And the waves poured into him, water poured into his boots. And then he stood up, and he turned to his courtiers, and he said, you idiots, don't flatter me. I'm the king. I get flattery morning, noon, and night for free. I need you to tell me what I'm doing wrong so I can govern better and never forget that only God can command the waves. And again, this was a story that was told in the proper version for centuries so that English-speaking people would know who should and who should not rule them. And now we get the Canute story wrong and we forget Alfred. When I teach history, I was asked by classes, who knows the story? There's one smart aleck in the back, but everybody else is like, what, Alfred? Um, but, but again, this, these are incredible tales that ought to be preserved and shared and remembered because throughout this long story, when liberty's been challenged, when kings have misbehaved, People in the English-speaking world have thought, if I stand up and say, don't do that, I will turn around and see a lot of people behind me and beside me, and then we can stand against the king. Whereas in most of the world, if you stood up and said, the czar is no good, let's have freedom, you'd be dead alone in 10 minutes. There's even a story during the, the fighting over Magna Carta, because of course, John being completely dishonest and vicious, after he sealed Magna Carta, he went and promised his kingdom to the Pope in return for the Pope annulling Magna Carta, which the Pope then duly did and excommunicated the barons. And Stephen Langton, the Archbishop of Canterbury, refused to read the excommunication out. He said, this is no good, this won't do. But then there's a war, and at one point, John is besieging Rochester Castle. And uh, it's, it's the strategically important point, and the defenders hold out for a while, and finally John manages to do one of those things where you tunnel under and burn out the supports, and half the castle collapses, and then they hold out in the other half for about another week before he manages to starve them out. Um, and uh, John said he was going to hang all the defenders and build a memorial to the pigs whose fat was used to burn the place out. But one of his advisors said, you know, Sire, you might one day lose a battle. Maybe this hanging isn't a good precedent. But again, you think, who are these people? There's a great movie. I think it's called Ironclad about, that, about the siege. But who are these people who decide, I'm not going to run away? I'm going to stand and oppose King John and his men. And, you know, I know what could happen to my family. And, you know, presumably when they discuss it with their family and say, well, what do you think? Should we, like, lick John's boots or die on our feet? And, and so it's not just the guys with the bows and the swords, but the, the people behind them who said, we, we can't let John do this. The, this is, this is a, a tale, again, of, of wonderful heroism that has the strange added benefit of being true. And I think we should cherish it. Yes. Well, please give everyone your website um, so that they can go and see these documentaries and more of this history because we don't want uh, anyone to miss out on, the, on that. Well, it's just johnrobson.ca and then you go to the documentaries tab. And we, there's one on World War I, which I think is an underappreciated triumph of the free societies in a terribly difficult situation. There's Magna Carta, our shared legacy of liberty. There's Too Strong and Free, Fixing Canada's Constitution. There's a right to arms about self-defense because, you know, in the end, if you can't stand up to the king, he will trample your rights. And then there's my 2017, The Environment of True Story, which is about uh, climate change and what's wrong with the orthodoxy. And as I say, they're all free, but... Um, I am crowdfunded. Don't be fooled by the fact that I'm a columnist. The media is not a lucrative uh, profession these days. Uh, but what, whether you can afford to uh, make a little uh, contribution or not, you can watch the documentaries free on YouTube. And I really 
watch the Magna Carta documentary and discover that you are part of a great and exciting story. And, you know, think about the Lord of the Rings, which is one of my favorite stories, again, and a very Christian, although Tolkien hated uh, allegory. So it's, it's, it's not immediately obvious. But one of the great things about the Lord of the Rings is it's the hobbits play the critical role of the least likely people in the world. They're small, they're weak, they don't know anything, they're completely, they have no idea where they're going or what's going on. And, and yet, as Tolkien understood, it is the ordinary people who do extraordinary things. And that's certainly true in the story of Magna Carta. There are extraordinary people doing extraordinary things, good and bad. But there are also ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And that's the real Canada. That's the real Canadian constitutional order. And that is the legacy that we should be proud to inherit and determined to uphold. Wow. Absolutely well said. And, uh, it, you know, most of you listening are probably ordinary people. Some of you have gotten involved. Some of you are very politically minded and some of you are not. But I hope this has been an, a history lesson that you will not soon forget because it shouldn't be forgotten and it needs to be told and retold and remembered. And uh, so thank you so much. Um, I, do we have time to talk about any, any more about uh, self-defense and our right to self-defense or are we going to wrap this up? I'll uh, defer to your judgment <laughs> and, and watches. Well, maybe, maybe we should uh, schedule another event. I also wanted to ask about... Uh, the impact of precedence, judicial activism, and how all that stuff has been uh, manifested through the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. But maybe we should save that for another. This is a there's a lot of meat packed into this little episode. And uh, John, yeah, I, wish I, I, I wish I would have had you for a history yeah. teacher. I, I actually had some good history teachers, but but I think uh, Canadian young people need to hear these things, and I'm I'm afraid many of them are not even getting uh, a whiff of, of these things. And uh, these are such important lessons for us. So folks, go to johnrobson.ca, check out the documentaries. We have several of the DVDs and uh, have watched them a couple of times, Magna Carta. There's, there's so much to absorb, you can't get it all in one shot. Fortunately, this uh, interview has been recorded, so you can listen to it more than once, and I think you'll need to if you want to absorb all of these details. So, John, it's been a real privilege and a pleasure to have you with us today, and thank you for what you're doing. You're most welcome. Thanks for having me on. Well, thank you again, and uh, both of you, it's been it's been great, and all of you who have uh, listened and watched, we, we thank you for your attention. Uh, go to chp.ca if you want to uh, learn more about the CHP, and go to johnrobson.ca to learn more about your history as a Canadian, as somebody who is uh, probably part of the Western world. So thank you all. God bless. Hope to see you next week. Thanks so much.